when we were first recording it, which was 68 around then, and I started to write it in 67, a few bits and pieces from it, it grew over a period of time. What I didn't realise is that was that Kit Lambert, who was the producer for The Who and the manager of The Who at the time, um, had uh, who had come in and take, taken over management of The Who with his partner, Chris Stamp, in the hope of becoming a, a, a filmmaker, uh, making films about rock and roll and doing rock and roll movie projects. And uh, as soon as I started to work on Tommy, he was very, very, very encouraging in making it as ambitious and as broad in scope as possible. He was the one that suggested it scanned a lot of, a long period of time, more than a normal lifetime. He was the one that talked about it being a post uh, two wars, a pro project, a, 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 a story about two wars, uh, the First World War and the Second World War and, and the inheritance that the young British public had. And uh, and almost as soon as it was finished as an album, he had, it, it occurred, it, it turned out later, had already written a screenplay, which uh, uh, apparently at some point, I don't really remember, Chris Stamp tells me that I, he, he flew past me and, uh, and, I uh, I rejected it. I can't really work out quite why I would have rejected it or impeded him. I think the only reason I might have impeded him was because I was very close to him and very fond of him and very dependent on him emotionally and probably was afraid that he was going to go off to Hollywood and make a film. So <clears throat> that's where I first heard that he'd made a script, but I'd blocked it. I blocked that movie so Kit didn't get to make that movie. Um, a later subtext to this is, is is that when I came to deliver my film script to Universal, um, based on Lifehouse, which is the Who's Music of, uh, with Barbara Riley Won't Get Fooled Again Behind Blue Eyes, that period, which is 1971, uh, Kit, behind my back, <clears throat> tried to slide in the original Tommy project underneath that and, and, and uh, cause some disarray and confusion around that time and neither project got made. Um, uh, subsequently, uh, what caused uh, Ken Russell to become interested in the movie much later was the fact that I gave permission to Lou Reisner to do an orchestral version. And, and the orchestral version was what gave Ken Russell the way in. I think if he hadn't have had the, the orchestral version, Ken, who was a great classical music man, wouldn't have found a way in. So Ken actually, Ken, Ken actually approached you? For the movie? No, Chris Stamp was approached by first. The first offer that we got was was uh, through Hammer Films. Uh, they were the people that I first sat down and talked to about it. And then subsequently, and that was with Chris Stamp. Chris Stamp was our co-manager with Kit Lambert. Chris Stamp then um, uh, talked to Stigwood about it, and Robert Stigwood and the Who had a long history, great friends and great allies uh, from the very very beginning, and. Uh, so that seemed, we seemed natural partners for it. How did the first meetings with Ken go with regards to the movie? I mean, wasn't that, that was a bit strange, wasn't they, the first meeting you had? Um, well, I was left pretty much to my own devices. I, I, he already had a patchwork screenplay, <clears throat> which, what would you call it, a treatment, which, he, which I don't think he deviated from very much. But our first meeting, I went to see him in a, a he had a, a beautiful big house in uh, in Notting Hill Gate and uh, he played me lots of music he played me lots of um, what you'd call sort of orchestral program music and uh, and then we worked through and we talked a lot about music and and what we shared in common in 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 terms of, of orchestral music uh, and then we listened through to the Lou Reisner version and um, and then over a period of weeks, I saw him two or three more times. He produced the screenplays that we, sh we that we shot too. I didn't have a tremendous amount to do with it. Did you feel that Ken was the man to bring out the spiritual elements in the story? Oh God, no. I mean, I, you know, I'm not even sure really that 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 I was worried. But when I was making Tommy, I was very very concerned to make sure that 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 we that we dealt with. With something really quite deep, and and 
a few years before, or or no, a, 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 about a year before I'd started to write it, I'd come across uh, a, an Indian spiritual master called Meher Baba and started to read about his uh, <coughs> message and uh, was very inspired by it. And uh, But all around in the time, a, a pop at the time, was a lot of acid, a lot of psychedelic, drugs, a lot of psychedelic imagery, a lot of uh, uh, hippie stuff going on. I mean, there was some fantastic stuff in there. I mean, Pink Floyd were around, The Soft Machine, Arthur Brown. There were some very, and in America, there were also the, you know, equivalents over there. But The Who did not fit into that. And we'd had a, a very strange time. We'd, we'd uh, had a, a, a terrific two-year run of, of hit singles in the UK, and, and I'd kind of run out of steam. I'd just written myself out. The final song that I, that I wrote for the Who single was, uh, uh, that was successful was I Can See For Miles, and after that I felt I had nowhere to go. And, um, but I felt that if we could achieve anything, if I could achieve anything, if it had a spiritual subtext, it would straddle the world of pop from which we'd come and this new hippie world that seemed to be about new age values and, well, we all know what the hippies stood for. Um, but there was another uh, uh, reason for the, for the, the spiritual uh, content, which was that I, I felt that uh, the pop song, in a way, <coughs> was, was designed to deal with spiritual matters, uh, uh, spiritual issues with young people that that was all it was about and that you know when people say uh, no pop music is for singing and dancing I, I my response is yes well hey what could be more spiritual than that you know um and what can be more freeing and what can be more true to you know to the redemption of the human spirit and difficulty that you know good pop at its best frees the spirit so was to make us a, 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 an album a story which had a series of singles and um, in the work that I'd seen of, of Ken's, Savage Messiah, uh, the, the film about Elgar, which is very, very, very straight film, Delius, uh, I saw a, a very, very powerful and dignified filmmaker. In, in um, the film that he made about Tchaikovsky, I saw a crazy man, somebody that used, and Strauss, Richard Strauss, he made a film about him as well, with, with you know, iconic imagery. And it really felt to me like what he had was a kind of a pop art knack. It seemed to me that he was the right man for the job. It was colourful, lots of, uh, I suppose, remember this is pre-video, you know, and it, it seemed to me like he had that kind of pop video approach. And he just seemed to be absolutely perfect. And uh, I think he turned out to be perfect for the, for the film that he made. He changed around some of the elements of the story, particularly the scene where the fa uh, lover kills the father rather than the other way around in the original. Did you need much convincing to allow him such a free reign? Doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter. The point of the death of the parent is that the child thinks that the parent is the parent. It doesn't matter whether the parent is the father or the lover. All that, the, all that the child knows is that the person that he thinks is his dad has been killed by somebody that he's never met before. So, as far as I was concerned, it was, it was a, a, a fine point. I didn't argue either way. It just doesn't matter. And in when we did the show, when we did the story on Broadway, we flipped it back again. It just really doesn't matter. I think the story has a bit more kind of resonance if the father stays with the child as he grows up. But, you know, in the modern world, what would be more you know, the other story is the one that's more common now, isn't it, that the mum, the single mum left behind would be with a new partner. So in a sense, in the modern world, it would work, it would work either way, really. You were required to write some new songs for the soundtrack to the album. How did it feel to revisit Tommy some five years after the original release? I'd, I'd, uh, I did the, the, the scoring for Tommy after I'd done Quadrophenia, which was very ambitious, and I'd used a lot of synthesizers in Quadrophenia, I'd used a lot of through composition, I'd done a lot of mixing themes. First ever work I'd done, this is gonna sound very pretentious, but the first time I'd ever done what they call contrapuntal work, where you take three or four melodies and mix them together, and in Quadrophenia at the end, there are four separate melodies that are combined and elegantly sit together. 
So I felt very confident that I could do pretty much anything that uh, Ken asked me to do. But there were two things going on. The key person in this whole thing is Terry Rawlings, who was my music editor. Now, Terry Rawlings is a brilliant film editor, uh, an inspired and, and, and really generous-spirited guy. And what he did is he led me through the process of the scoring side. He made it possible for... He was like my, my Mac computer in the days before there were computers. He gave me exact timings and precise lengths for pieces that were required to bridge certain sections. He told me what their emotional content was, was going to need to be. He taught me, in a sense, how to please Ken, who I think he'd worked with once or twice before. Ken, on the other hand, wanted dramatic fixes... He wanted uh, Anne-Margaret to have a song about money. He wanted Anne-Margaret and Oliver Reed to have a song about, about the, the evolution of the holiday camp, in which there was more to it than just that da, 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 holiday camp song, you know. And, uh, and quite a few chunks where he, he needed to bridge s sections with, with new lyrics. And... Uh, uh, without Terry's involvement, I would have found it really, really hard. And I have to say, it was so hard, ultimately. The work was so technically difficult that when I'd finished, despite the fact that, that to this day, you know, I would definitely do a... I'm not worthy with, with Terry Rawlings because he's such a giant of a man. Uh, I'd swore I'd never make another film again <laughs> as a composer. And I haven't. I haven't. In fact, uh, Terry... Uh, arranged for me to read an early script of Blade Runner um, and I turned it down. You know, I kind of read through it and I went, no, oh, take it away, take it away, you know, bec um, which he edited. And uh, I don't think I would have done a particularly good job on it anyway. And, and I love what uh, Vangelis did with it. It's just wonderful. The whole thing is wonderful. But uh, at that time, it was like never, I, I never want to see another one and two thirds seconds timing ever again. That's what frames turn out to be, one and two thirds, one and three thirds and one and half a third. And, uh, but the songs that I wrote uh, to, for, to order for Ken were quite easy because they had specific briefs. You know, he wanted something very specific. What I had problems with was trying to find ways to write new songs without them being too new. So instead of them just being out of the box, I had to try to use themes from elsewhere in, in, in the, uh, the song collection. And because of the work that I'd done on Quadrophenia, I felt quite well equipped to do that. As you say, before the filming had even started, you'd agreed to supervise the re-recording of the music. And the, you and John cut most of the basic tracks and then brought in other players. That's right. Why did you do that rather than just record with The Who? Um, There's a huge amount of work involved and a huge amount of discipline involved in it and uh, to cut a long story short, Keith Moon wasn't in very good shape. Um, so we, we decided to... Uh, and when you say that John and I did it together, we didn't actually do it together. I did it with... Uh, uh, John wasn't particularly involved in it. Um, uh, I did it with Ken. And... Um, uh, we just, we had a studio. While we were building that studio, uh, I was, I had, uh, when I, when we were recording Quadrophenia with The Who, um, Ken was visiting and we were doing some of the film tracks almost at the same time. You know, things were happening simultaneously. The two, the two projects overlapped. So it was a tremendous amount of, uh, of effort. And The Who were doing gigs at the time as well. So it was quite, quite a difficult, Program, but the main thing was is that uh, Keith wasn't up to if if for example when we did Sparks and Underture where Keith could play from memory he did a fantastic job you know he just played what he played but but if you started to say to him no this bit's going to be longer you know he would get frustrated he was hanging out with o o Oliver Reed he and Oliver Reed were having these absurd drinking competitions and and trying to you know demonstrate one to the other. You know, I can say what I like because they're both dead. Um, they were shagging in the back, you know, they were, they were, you know, going off to men's lavatories. Pair of right queens they were. And uh, <laughs> um, 
they were having drinking competitions and and leading one another on a bit and and it was it was taking its toll on Keith you know and, and uh, in the movie luckily he played Uncle Ernie so it, you know the toll that it took on him it didn't matter because the worse he looked the more in character he became but in the studio it wasn't particularly useful the other thing was I suppose is that I wanted to bring some fresh ideas and fresh energy to the tracks um, you know I'd, I I I I I enjoyed working with with uh, uh, friends of mine like the guys from the faces like like Ronnie Wood Ronnie Lane Kenny Jones I'd often done recording with them uh, as friends um, and um, new keyboard players that we were starting to use you know Chris Staten um, uh, Nick, Nicky Hopkins. Nicky Hopkins was fabulous on this. Is another one that's the late Nicky, Nicky Hopkins. He was fabulous on, on Tommy. Very creative, and he did a lot of direct composing, not composing, elaborations, and uh, what would you call it? Um, kind of imaginative program music for Ken. Particularly, he was the one that turned the song Christmas into a, you know, a Christmas song. You mentioned Oliver Reed. How much of a say did you have in the casting of the film? I mean, on paper, people like Oliver Reed and Jack Nicholson seem a strange choice for a musical. I was worried. Um, I was worried about all those choices. I was quite worried about Anne Margaret, too. I, I, she seemed uh, too glamorous, really, for the role. I don't know. I was worried about almost everybody that was cast. At the time, you suggested names such as Tiny Tim for the Pimble Wizard and even Lou Reed for the Acid Queen. Um, and newspapers mentioned Bowie and Jagger as having roles. How do you think that would have worked out now in hindsight? I, 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 I know those names have, have, have emerged in, in, in the epoch, but, uh, you know, I think that, that, that what you're probably talking about is what I would call brainstorm listings. In other words, we would write down hundreds of names. In the same list that Time Me Tim was mentioned, so was Stevie Wonder. So, you know, you can pick on Tiny Tim, but you can also pick on T T Stevie Wonder, who nearly did it. He nearly did it. The problem that I had with Stevie was trying to convince him that it was okay for a black blind guy to actually play the pinball wizard. And, but at the end, he just, somebody in his group, because he, he was in the UK when we were recording, said to him, listen, these guys are, are, are taking the piss, you know, get them out of here. And because uh, a few years later I met him in LA and we talked about it again and he said, you know, were you joking or not? And I said, no, I just think you would have been fucking brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You know, going around like that on the stage, you know, being being the pinball wizard. It, and I think the problem that his, his uh, brother had, because his brother used to look after him, I think the problem that his brother had, and I may be completely out of order here because I'm only guessing, if there was a problem, and his brother was definitely the, the manager was definitely the one that 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 that, uh, that cut it off. It was because at the end of it he loses and is carried off. And I think they felt that that probably was would be politically incorrect. I think extraordinarily today, in the American, uh, the way that the black community respond, they would have got into it and it would have been a gag and it would have been seen to be something quite positive. Listen, we can do what we like. You know, we, you, you, you know, we don't mind lying back and being beaten because it's not... A, but then there was some, still some political stuff going on. And um, Eric Clapton came with me one day to, to see Stevie uh, recording and he tried to convince him to do it. And... Uh, Never really quite got off. Tiny Tim would have been a, would have been a disaster, but amusing. Who else did I think of? Um, I think probably people like Mick Jagger and David Bowie. This was just box office stuff. I started to realise that what Robert Stigwood was after was box office names. And in the end, I had to trust between Robert Stigwood looking for box office names and Ken Russell saying, this guy, I promise you can do it. When he told me that he was going to use Oliver Reed, I said, you know, he can't sing, you know. And then, of course, Jack Nicholson followed on shortly after. I'd done two or three weeks in the studio with Ollie, who was a great fun to work with, but couldn't sing a note. We had to do it line by line and sometimes word by word. And I'm not exaggerating, you know. I'm your uncle. Roll back. Ernie and I. Welcome. 
You too? I mean, literally. I mean, it's all cut together. What's bizarre is that once he'd done it in bits, he could then do it, he could then do it live. It was weird. Anyway, um, Jack Nicholson was introduced and uh, Jack and I had a bit of a difficult time to start with uh, because it was like, you know, you know, I'm not going near you, you know, until you can prove to me that you can sing. And then he went out and he sang and he sang beautifully, actually. And uh, uh, and then we were OK. But he teased me about it for a long time afterwards, like, you know, you you know, you uh, you didn't think I could sing, did you? And I went, well, no, would you think you could sing? You know? <laughs> all, all I'd seen him in was Cuckoo's Nest, you know. And, uh, and but Anne Margaret was a pro, and the rest of the people that that, that worked in the sh in in the film they could all sing. Was Roger always the first choice to play the title role? Not in my book. Not in my book. I didn't really. I didn't even really want the band to be in it. I couldn't really see where we we were going to fit in. And you know, when we were rowed in as ourselves, I thought it was really quite strange. Uh, But already, because Roger was a bit too old, I felt. So, uh, yeah, he, he, he's an ob he is obviously an obvious choice. I mean, I, I first saw Roger singing Tommy from the audience when, he did, when we did the second live charity concert for, for the Lou Reisner thing, uh, the classical version. And I remember sitting with my wife then and looking and saying to her, you know, this guy's good. You know, it's the first time I'd seen Roger from the floor. So I knew he could do a great Tommy, but I don't know. I, I suppose, you know, I've, Roger always, always felt that Tommy was his, and I've always felt that Tommy is mine, but for completely different reasons. Roger feels that he owns it because he is the, the singer, the main interpreter. It's kind of like... Yes, yeah, this, this has happened many times before, with a, with a performer being associated more with a, with a piece than the writer. I always felt that it was mine because it was so based on my reading of my childhood. We've touched on this already, but Tommy's obviously very spiritual and at times autobiographical. How easy was it to let someone else interpret that? And did you collaborate much with Ken during the filming? As the film progressed, I got drunker and drunker and drunker and eventually just sort of fell, up, fell on one side as a heap. I mean, literally, it was really a, a time when my drinking took off. I, I, I went, I'd, I'd been intensely involved in the studio. Then suddenly they were filming and I had nothing to do except get up at five in the morning for these early morning cons consultations with Ken, spend all day waiting while people you know, set shots up, you know, watch that, that I felt that their lip sync was OK, go back, have drinking competitions with lighting guys, which I don't recommend. They drink beer from buckets. Um, I remember one day trying to drink a bucket full of Guinness, and I managed to, I think, maybe get a quarter of it down before it just shot back out again in a projectile vomit. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he managed to drink three quarters of a proper bucket full of Guinness without retching. Just unbelievable. This is lighting, guys, for you. Um, and then after that, at about 11 o'clock, Ken would appear, and we'd have to spend the last two hours of the day from probably 11 at night to 1 in the morning looking at the, the next day's shooting. So both of us were only getting five day, hours of sleep. I don't know how he did it, but I know that I couldn't do it, you know, and I was... I, was, uh, I knew that the the dubbing was coming up and the post-production, the sound post-production was coming up. So I was quite worried about that. And I started, so I drifted away from it. And once, the other thing that I learned is that once it's on paper, that's it, that's the movie. You know, you don't deviate from that. You know, we're not talking about, you know, studio experiments here. You know, you've got a schedule and it's going to get done. So there were a few changes uh, and they started to happen in the editing. But they were mainly the length of pieces and stuff like that. You were very heavily involved in the technical side of the movie. The film was released in Quintaphonic, which is a precursor, really, to today's 5.1 sound. How did that come about? I'm not quite sure where it came from, but somewhere along the line, there was this, this fellow called John Mosley, who was the, the, the uh, chief, the managing engineer and a shareholder, at a big studio in Piccadilly called Command. Uh, Command didn't do particularly well 
in the pop field. It was it was an old BBC broadcast studio, I think, that had been taken over by him. And uh, it had American boards in it, and they were trying to drum up business. And somewhere in the middle of it, I met him uh, through Terry Rawlings and, and Bill Rowe, who was the dubbing engineer, and Tony Lumpkin, who was then the head of sound at Elstree, and uh, where we were going to do the dubbing and post-production, sound post-production. And... Uh, and he started to pitch this idea. Uh, I'd, of course, already looked into Codophonic Sound because I'd done all of the post-production work and pre-production work and mixing of Quadrophenia, which was, as far as I was con concerned, was going to be the first creative use of Quadrophonic Sound in, uh, in rock. Uh, in Quadrophenia, I had uh, divided the character of our hero into four narrative voices, each one which had attributes of a member of the Who, and each one that had a musical theme, and each one that occupied an oral space in the sound picture. And the idea was that at the moment when the character finds himself at the end and decides to go off on his spiritual search, in other words, when he, the story ends, the four themes would come together that I spoke about earlier, contrapuntally, and, and emerge in the middle with a great big glorious sort of shower of sound. And, and I experimented with SQ, which was CBS method. QS was the Sansui method, and favoured the Sansui method. Unfortunately, Universal had done a contract with CBS, and we had to use the SQ method, which didn't work very well, not from vinyl anyway. Um, so I was already aware of the effectiveness of the Sansui encoding of tape which produced four channels of sound from stereo, gave you two rears. Fairly discreet, fairly discreet too. It wasn't just one channel in the back, you know, you could move things from one corner to another. It was quite a discreet four channel process. And uh, um, so I was very excited about it and I wish we'd heard about it f earlier on because we could have done more um, some of the effects that we used and everything could have been recorded in quad, but we'd recorded multi-track, so a lot of the stuff could be could be uh, um, explored that way. John Mosley was very difficult to work with because he 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 wanted to to patent the whole business of of five channel cinema sound. He'd gotten involved with uh, with Ray Dolby and. Uh, at the same time, Ray Dolby was developing what became known as, as Dolby Optical, which was an optical stereo, noise-reduced uh, soundtrack, which immediately after Tommy really, really took off. This is what cinemas have been waiting for, an optical soundtrack, which a mono head could read and produce glorious, clean stereo. Uh, because what the film industry likes is 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 stuff that uh, t technology that follows up and sits on top of what's gone before, and um, in the middle of it all, there was some breakdown in communication between John Mosley, Ray Dolby, and also at the other time there was something else going on, which was that Tony Lumpkin one day hauled us all out and took us back to the lab up at Elstree and showed us a digital tape recorder. Um, which was the first that I'd ever heard of or seen. It was a digital machine, it worked, because uh, Elstree was then owned by EMI, who at uh, Abbey Road had been developing machines. And he said, this will be the future. And Tony was a great guy, and I was sure he was right. And, and th But they were talking about using digital technology in the future for, for film dubbing, which, of course, is what happens now. So there were lots of technological things going on, all of which we wanted to grab at. And uh, I had to bring in... Uh, my, a mixing desk from my home studio, a great big Neve desk and a second Neve desk that I owned uh, to complement the, the Neve which, which they had at Elstree. We had to set up extra speakers. It was elaborate but really exciting and when we got it going in the room it was just, God, it was extraordinary. You know, and this system, as we were recording it, we were, we were monitoring, we were recording down to, uh, to five tracks, I think, but we were monitoring back encoded occasionally we could test the the sensui decoding and it worked brilliantly and uh, um, I believe that around that time everybody including Ray Dolby who now of course uh, Dolby 
digital is is the is the main six channel system which derives from the five channel system that that happened back then the main uh, system that we're familiar with with DVDs um, the encoding that's involved there everybody started to realize this is something that could happen nobody had any idea it would take so long to reach the public it's really let's face it it's only today it's only last year really that people are starting to understand that they can have surround sound at home and the only problem is where do we hide the wire <laughs> to the speakers but apart from that we get this real true cinema experience at home uh, and we also start to realise that a lot in the past, a lot of movies have been made where, you know, going back maybe 10 or 20 years, where the sound dubs have been very exotic and technically adept for cinemas, but that's the only place that you've ever heard that sound, and now we can hear it at home. And we start to realise how much it adds to movies to hear the original uh, multi-channel sound dubs. Were many of the cinemas geared up to actually play it in Quintaphonic? No, we had to equip cinema specially, and uh, the main uh, prints that went out into the world at large were either three-track mag, uh, or, uh, of course, this new stereo Dolby Optical. In fact, I think there was an experiment somewhere to take the stereo optical and turn it into a five-channel in some way. Uh, but... Um, in fact, Dolby then did start to work on their own encoding, and I now understand that they they bought in the Sensui system and incorporated it into their current uh, very, very elaborate and intelligent uh, uh, decoding systems. And they also, of course, Dolby also, uh, um, like some of the other systems like DTS, do, do uh, surround sound synthesis as well. You mentioned that when you was recording Quadrophenia, you was frustrated by not being able to get the sound you wanted. Do you feel this technology allowed you everything you wanted to do? Um, I, you know, it, as I said, this was something that happened quite late in the day. You know, I mean, just before we were about to start dubbing, I was introduced to uh, John Mosley. Uh, we weren't aware of it. I wasn't aware that this was on the cards when we were recording. So it certainly wasn't an ambition of mine. Um, it was one that I suppose I gladly picked up, you know, where are we, 75, was it? Came out 75. So seven, probably dubbing in 74. 73 was when I'd been, you know, fighting to get this quad sorted out on uh, Quadrophenia. And the limitation really there was the vinyl disc. You know, it was a stereo track, you know, encoding, so there's very little low end so separation between the left and the right on a vinyl track anyway. Uh, you know, 5-1 sound as we know it today wouldn't exist without the DV, the, 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 the versatile digital disc, the CD optical platter. It would never have happened uh, from vinyl. You know, there was, it, we tried and it wouldn't work. You mentioned that The Who was still performing while filming was going on. And during filming, you did a show in Portsmouth for some of the students that performed as extras in the film. You said at the time it was one of the most enjoyable, or one of the best gigs the band had done. And yet a month later, you performed at Madison Square Garden, and you seemed almost disillusioned with both playing live and being in the band. Do you think the heavy workload you had taken on during filming affected you with this? No, not quite. I think, I think there was something else going on, which is he's going back to America... Uh, to perform, um, not sure of the chronology, if, whether that was before the movie had come out or after. Was it yeah. before? Well, I would have thought that you know that there would have been a sense that maybe that 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 uh, um, I was probably exhausted. And as I said, you know, the drinking had taken a toll on me as well. You know, I I had definitely. Um, built up a, you know, a, a, a habit of drinking every day and I uh, hadn't seen very much of my family for a long time. In fact, at one time when doing the post-production work, I'd, I'd actually put another multi-trap machine down in my living room, wired it up the hallway because I had my studio at the top of the house and was running up and down the stairs to, you know, to, to, to put tape reels on. You know, it was, I was using my home 
as uh, as part of the Tommy production thing. I don't really really don't quite know how my wife stood it. I suppose she just didn't really have much choice. Um, I think also there was a sense. There's always been a sense that I, I think if I have a character defect, it is that I find it very difficult to look after myself and to say no. And uh, I know I kept you gentlemen waiting today. I mean, that's an example of the way I try to do things differently. And if it gets to lunchtime and I haven't eaten, I don't just keep working because I think, well, I'm not going to do a very good job. So, you know, but at that particular time, I, I, I really just didn't know how to say no. And I, there were a lot of things that, you know, we sh the short fact of it is that we shouldn't have been playing at Madison Square Gardens for two, two or three nights, whatever it was at that particular time. And, uh, and I particularly did not appreciate the, the response to the difficulties that I had at the time, you know, because I had worked so hard. Roger had worked very, very hard as well. Keith had worked hard, John had worked, we'd all worked very, very hard. And the kind of spoiled bratness of, lo of the lot of the Who fans at the time and, and the way that the band divided on the issue of what was going on with our fans, I found it very, very difficult to deal with. Because Tommy, as far as the fans were concerned, was pretty old hat. They hadn't seen the film. I think a lot of Who fans, when they did see the film, didn't particularly like it. So, it, Ken's film is very, very English, you know, and that's what I loved about it. You know, it's, it was very much, and I think a lot of Americans had used the vagueness of the original story to, to, to fill in their, that's what what makes good popular art is is that making it making a hole in it so that you can put yourself into the middle of it and and I think it felt appropriated but no that was a hard time. You mentioned the very Englishness of the movie and that's what you loved about it. What was was that your initial reaction when you saw the finished article? It is it, it, when I first started to look at the script I realised that what Ken shared with me was that I divide the day. People born either de outside of VE Day into what I call the you know the crows and the finches. We're numerous, but some of us are pre-war, and thus crows, and some of us are post VA Day, and we're finches. We're more colourful, and uh, and less burdened. Um, Ken's t ten years older than I am, maybe even a bit older than that, and so he's from the from the group prior. That if there's a generation gap, it was created at, around VE Day. And of course, there are people that could cross over, like Ken, like George Malley, like like uh, all kinds of people, like Kit Lambert, who's a few years older than me as well. But when I first saw the script, I realised that what he'd actually been able to do was to was to really locate the the actual telling of the story in a proper chronological context in other words in other words to take away the vagueness of the original context that we'd had and let's say this is the end this the war is still going on there's still a there's a blitz going on bombs are dropping uh, this couple meet they get married Tommy is born at the end of the war and therefore then what we actually have is a story that relates very much to the emergence of the rock the guitar rock hero around the early 60s uh, as a folk singing, um, ob observer, reflecting mirror to uh, the disaffection and difficulty of, of the, the young working class men in particular, but, uh, you know, families, I suppose, young families were having, getting used to the fact that they were having to find a new way of, of, of uh, getting dignity, respect, and finding a way of establishing them, themselves in, in the order of society without being a member of the services. Because everybody in the previous generation had been in the services. Every single one of them. If they hadn't been in the services, they were either um, uh, black marketeers or um, they, they did some other work, which, which, which uh, or that they were conscientious objectors. So, what we were able to do, in, it, 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 what, what Ken did, and what I, it was, was he enabled me to suddenly grasp the fact that this was a story of, uh, that was very much my story, my childhood story, but also a story which, it, what it actually happened was is that I suddenly realised, oh, now I understand why everybody likes what I do. 
because I couldn't really quite work it out. I couldn't really quite work it out why Tommy had been so accepted. I suddenly realised that it had been accepted because it was like holding up a mirror to an entire generation of people who said, yes, this is me, this is what I feel, and uh, this is what I went through, this is my experience, not precisely, but very much, or an experience that, 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 that uh, many shared, and that... that uh, Ken's film, the Englishness of it, the Britishness of it, the the colourful quality of it, the humour in it, it's all, it's all, it's, it's bits of it are almost like a carry on film. Bits of it are almost like a, like a, like like a parody of of English life. Uh, the holiday camp scene, you know, it's not overdone. I grew up on those holiday camps. They were worse than that. You know, they were crazier than that. Um, my father did, you know. 15 summer seasons at uh, at various butlers ho ho holiday camps you know that I I I I developed my my tactics for escaping from difficult situations by escaping from holiday camps when I was only 4 you know you up the chain mail it's like getting out of prison camp and um so he was the right guy to observe that. The only thing I would say is that because he was a pre-VE day guy, you know, he was born in the war and grew up in the war, he was with those people whose suffering was very different. The suffering of people in the war was real. Real bombs had dropped on them. My mother and father played at a concert in Bristol when the back of the theatre was bombed and they both pull, pulled out bits of people from the rubble. You know, it's hard to imagine what that could have been like. So you open up with this scene of three sexy chorus girls, you know, with gas masks on, walking across rubble, and you see this teddy bear, you know, it's in the rubble. What you know is that this is something that Ken has seen. Other people, of course, were evacuated taken away from their, their parents and sent to the countryside and often sent to, to into the care of people who didn't take care of them properly because they thought, we're all dead anyway, you know. Who, you know and, and, uh, so, and when you came home from those places, you were expected to be grateful. You know, you're alive, you know, there's peace now. Just shut up about the war. So nobody talked about it. You know, if you sat with your granddad and you said, what was it like? You just say, listen, I don't want to know. As we now read about the war, we know why. It was absolutely shocking. Shocking beyond belief. And, uh, but my generation, which was born post-VE day, all we got was the party. You know, it was like, it's all over. You know, the first four years of my life were just glorious. You know, travelling around in the the group bus, going to Butlins, everybody singing, dancing, jumping in the swimming pool, you know, lovely legs competitions. I mean, literally, Ken got that. But Ken also had a sense of what had gone before, which I didn't have until I got involved with him and, and worked through the story of the movie. The My generation, rem we remember the end of the war, the bomb, you know, and that was our, our thing. You know, Victor Gollance, Bertrand Russell, it's the bomb, 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 it's the bomb. The only thing that matters is the bomb, it's the bomb, it's the bomb, it's the bomb. It's the one thing that's never happened to us is the fucking bomb. Everything else has happened. But that's what they told us, was that we would all be of jelly and green slime coming out of our ears, and so there was no point going on. Then the Cuban crisis happened, and guess what? You know, the brilliant Kennedy brothers and McNamara and a few other people sorted it out, and we, we're still here. So... What Ken was able to do was to place the Tommy story, which was kind of a mirror abstract on a whole generation, and really solidly locate it, and it solidly located it in England. So it's a quintessentially English film. I think in the last 20 years, Americans have come to understand a lot more about post-war England. Uh, and so the film is easier for them to grasp now and get to grips with. It's, it's still a bit, of a, a bit of a parochial piece, I think more than the album was. Yeah, I think at the time it definitely polarised audiences. People either loved it or wasn't quite sure about it. I won't say hate it, but they wasn't quite sure about it. But it's become a bit of a cult classic now. And I think revisiting it, it's obviously very powerful. I mean, you've explained a lot of reasons why. I mean, it, there are some very powerful scenes in it. Uh, how do you look at it now? I mean, has your idea of the film changed over the years? The thing that I've had to carry with me is the fact that <clears throat> that um, 
the the is the the scenes of abuse in the film and the scenes of 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 of, uh, of drug use, the scenes of bullying, uh, which were meant in a sense to be, um, they were meant to be kind of images that were you know l like archetypical but average scenes of of, of modern post war life, and I now see actually lo looking at the f the film and and you know again when I came to do the Broadway version of this story with, with Des McEnough, I started to get an understanding that this was something that very, was very, very close to my experience, and a lot of it had unconsciously come out onto the page, um, is that um, some of that stuff is, is stuff that we're aware of, the broader spread of responsibility, for example, for, 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 for what happens when children are bullied for what happens when uh, people, young people become involved in, uh, in drugs, for what happens when they want to recover, for what happens when children are sexually abused, what happens when uh, children are in the care of people that they shouldn't be left in the care of. We now realise that the responsibility for all of those problems is something that is much more broadly shared. So what actually happens when we watch that stuff now is that it's not... It's not something that you can laugh at in quite the way that we tried to do in 1974. You know, at that time, there was still a sense that that uh, Tina Turner had to be turned into a kind of a gibbering heroin crack addict, you know, and she did a good job of it. But she had to be made to be made to seem completely and utterly out of control and crazy and 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 psychotic, uh, rather than what we know today, which is is that that uh, the, the 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 prostitute is both has 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 a responsibility for his or her actions, but also is a victim, and that the two things do coexist. You can be responsible for your own actions and be a victim and that it's important to own both of those elements of your experience before you can become what I call a survivor and so for me and what what I learned uh, it, it, what I've learned from Tommy over the years and the film is a big part of this watching it again today is is that um, survival is, in society is what's the most important thing surviving being able to get through a day, being able to have dignity and self-respect. It's disturbing to me today to know that my story uh, is in a sense so universal, you know, that so many people had similar experiences because when my parents, uh, uh, they were both RAF after the war, they were both keen to get back to their proper jobs of making music. I was two and a half, three, four. It, it, when I was about four, uh, something went wrong with my parents' marriage. And this was very, very, very common because people had been thrown together at the end of the war. And, uh, um, and my mother uh, decided to start to put me out into the care of various people and she tried a few people. And in the end, she decided to go and send me with my grandmother, send me to stay with my grandmother who lived down in Westgate by the sea. And, it, and that was a terrifying experience for me partly because of the fact that my grandmother was so sick mentally at the time it was also strange because my grandmother had abandoned my mother so my mother was kind of giving me to the person who had abandoned her in this kind of endless cycle of of uh really kind of you know reenacted uh, psychological nonsense and um The chief, the chief impact that it had on me, because I did eventually go back home and I went back to my neighbourhood and back to my friends and back to the world that I knew in Acton where I'd grown up and, uh, and then it was realised that my grandmother had been sick and various strange things had gone on. That um, for her and for me, um, it's not quite like, you know, I'm not, exa it's not exactly, you know, a, bo a child called it story. Uh, you know, but when I was with my grandmother, it was very, very, very shocking and lonely and disturbing. And what made it worse was is that my mother used to come down sometimes to visit me and stay quite briefly and then go away. And that my father used to communicate to me often with a letter and a postal order. So 
I felt very isolated. I felt trapped and imprisoned. And when I came back, what I realised was is that I'd been scarred with something which is really, really, really common today, particularly for men, but for, I think for women too. Women have a, 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 a better, a better uh, mechanism for handling it, which is that they can have children, which men can't do. Men, can't, men can make children, but they can't have them, uh, which is abandonment. I have a tremendous problem with abandonment. And, um, uh, and so what that does is that creates a sense in me where I, I will try to help too much. I will say, you know, I'll try to say yes to things when I should say no. Um, I'm always afraid that if I make a commitment to somebody that, that where I go too far, that they might take everything that, that I've got to give and then not give anything back, that they might desert me. And at the heart of Tommy and at the heart of probably all of my work, and funnily enough, of a lot of blues music, which uh, the British um, uh, 60s bands picked up, the, the tail end of it, R&B, which was the chart version of the blues in America. You know, people like Chuck Berry, John Lee Hooker, Bo Diddley, um, uh, Artist of that, Ray Charles, to a great extent. A lot of, of, of those artists uh, was that feeling that, you know, that you trust somebody, you put yourself in their care, and then they abandon you. And that, uh, and that the way that you, you deal with that sense of abandonment, the threat of abandonment, the possibility that you're going to be cast aside by society, by the people that you care about, is through music. And uh, that Tommy is very much, a, in a way, um, not only a story about Tommy, but also it's also a story, in a way, about that process, because it includes the beginning, the middle, and the end, which is the, the artist becoming the great messiah, who then falls from grace, and um, which is inevitable. When, when, when the person who holds up the mirror says to you, oh, and by the way, you know, I'm not just like you, I am you. You know, you are me. We have, we both, we both share the same condition, and uh, so for me today, like look, uh, looking at Tommy, what I see is, is 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 that I had I had no idea. You know, if you if you remember that before I made the film, I'd also worked on Lifehouse, pre, 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 uh, had prefigured, had a pre sense of of the internet, the World Wide Web, what that would do to to the world as we know it, what it would do particularly to to uh, 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 vulnerable people who who uh, 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 needed support, needed friendship, who felt isolated, who felt lonely, and would would normally look to you know to music, dancing, and maybe drink drugs and housebreaking, as I often say, you know, for ways of uh, of, of of finding themselves would find themselves stuck. In, in my Lifehouse story, it wasn't in front of a computer screen. It was in a, an experience suit, you know, in the ultimate couch potato experience where you don't even live your own life. And uh, so for me, the whole, the, the, what I've tried to do, practically speaking, in my life is not only deal with the art, but also to deal with the result. And I used the word earlier on survivor. I regard myself as a survivor of childhood abuse, of the post-war apocalyptic condition of irresponsible parenting, of neglect, of uh, brutality, of bullying, of uh, social cowardice, of, 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 of bad education, of, of poor guidance, extraordinarily dishonest policing. Um, I mean, right the way across the world, ev ev everything that I look at, I have somehow survived. And I know that I've survived it simply by being true to my own belief system. And my own belief system is something that I've developed by being a performer and a musician and a commentator. I look at the people around me and I try to serve them. And by serving them, I find myself. And when I find myself, sometimes I find somebody that's not maybe 98% right. And um, Tommy is that. Tommy is a, 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 a you know, a a cockle shell of, 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 of that whole period of, of growth. You know, I think we're kind of getting through to the other side of it now. You know, we've just had the Iraq war, and whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, what we know now is that it's safe for anybody to say what's on their mind. 
whether they're for it, whether they're against it, whether they're undecided, whatever, is this, it's safe to speak. You know, freedom of speech is vital. Freedom of action is also important. And, um, you know, in the Tommy story, what you see is somebody who, who gets caught up in a, in a, a whirl of, of uh, uh, what do they call it? What's the buzzword of the, of, of the decade? Dysfunction, the dysfunctional family. You know, what's a dysfunctional family? normal people <laughs> and often people with good hearts that haven't been taught how to live properly you know so a lot of that stuff that 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 you see in Tommy which is which is parodied which is colorful which is light and it's set to this kind of funny music you know when you know the background of it there comes a point at which you know you want to you, you want to scream out you know oh my god I wish I'd I wish I'd really known my history before I started on this. I wish I'd done a bit of research and uh, done it subsequently, but now all I can do is try and bleed it back into the project and give the project not greater depth, I'm not trying to be pretentious about this, but to give some understanding of possibly why it resonated so deeply with the public. It's a, you know, if it's such a silly fucking story, as everybody keeps telling me, if it's so pretentious, if the whole idea of rock opera is such a fucking cock idea, why has it grossed so many millions of dollars? Why do people love it so much? I think it's, it's because it has this way of triggering stuff that is deep-seated, and that's all, and I did it, you know, quite uh, disingenuously, you know. <laughs>